Um, thank you, um, the moderators. Our colleagues, thank you, and uh, how are you again? Um, so we are to talk about transformative practices. And um, <laughs> uh, it is one of the uh, three, di four dimensions uh, on our theme for this conference. And just for everyone, uh, this seems to sit very well uh, within the mission of Africa Philanthropy Network because we are to, um, our mission is to elevate the practices and um, to reclaim the power in various ways of giving in the continent. So this sits very well and um, we therefore leverage the connection and influences and we also uh, work to make the Africa philanthropy practices visible uh, to make the voice heard and also to support the values and mission for Africa philanthropy. Um, again, we are going to focus on practices and as we understand the practices um, are really core when we speak about the current narrative of African philanthropy because we always link them to different kind of or ways of philanthropic giving or philanthropic practices. And um, so this conversation I think comes um, at the right time uh, because we all here represent one or more forms of philanthropic giving practices and that is why we are here. And then let's look into how can we make those practices more transformative. We have seen currently, and you'll agree with me that um, the, there are more, there are increasing number of uh, practices in the continent. Those who, which existed um, from um, as long as um, uh, African uh, uh, DNA, uh, which are very much informal, horizontal philanthropy, but there are those that are emerging now, including the institution of philanthropy. And that increasing number requires uh, to be coordinated, to, be, um, to enhance collaboration. And also we have seen now um, very much um, shift in strategies that most of us here in the room are using to embrace more participation and to embrace more systemic approach and to embrace more collaborative approaches. We have been hearing a keynote speaker talking about the, the, the importance of collaborating and the importance of ensuring that we have the right mindset for us to be able to listen to each other and collaborate. So we see that in the sector also happening. And uh, over and above, we see most of the actors in the philanthropy landscape in the continent <clears throat> um, adapting different ways of ensuring that there is more and better resources uh, for community to lead their own development, uh, for women to lead their own development, and for young people to, be, uh, to have meaningful engagement in ensuring that they are leading their own development, but they're also addressing their own social economic uh, challenges, and they're also uh, driving their own aspirations for proven solutions to the challenges that are facing the continent. With me, I'm joined by three very important personalities. The first one is Mosun Layode, who is the executive director at the Africa Philanthropy Forum, and followed by uh, Hakima Abbas, who is the co-founder and the director at the Black Feminist Fund and Evan Sokini, who is the executive director of the East Africa Philanthropy Network. So um, welcome, thank you, uh, help me to welcome them to this stage uh, by clapping your hands and um, appreciating their time and thank you for making time for this. And again, let me tell you one thing, this is going to be one of the most important but one of the most memorable session. And why? Because we are going to spend 50% of the time that was allocated. But second is because it is a concern of all of us. So we have all been part and parcel of co-creation of this conversation. So it is our conversation. So we feel strongly that we are all going to be involved and engaged to ensure that we have the conversation. We may not have adequate time for us to contribute from the plenary, but we'll try to. But whatever contribution you have, 
ensure that you have written them down and pass them on to um, some of the co-organizers here would really wish to find ways to continue with these conversations between now and next year um, when we'll be looking to organize another, another uh, conference like this one. And because we are discussing about African agency, and I think we all now have to be, to pay very good attention to the work that we are going to, to the discussion we are going to have. I would like to um, ask my colleagues to start with, to introduce themselves a little bit and the work that they're doing, so that we'll be able to connect what they're doing into to what they will be talking about soon. I'll start with you more soon. Thank you. Good morning again. I'm Musun Layode. I serve as the executive director at African Philanthropy Forum. We are a nonprofit organization that was established by the Global Philanthropy Forum, which is based in, in California in 2014. But in 2017, we became an independent entity registered in Nigeria and in South Africa. And I would say that that's when our journey really began, but essentially we're a network of philanthropists and, and givers um, across the continent that are committed to inclusive and sustainable development. We're best known for our convenings, and I'm sure quite a number of people here have been to our convenings, but I always say that we are more than a convener at African Philanthropy Forum. Our goal really is to transform the culture of giving to the extent that it exceeds development aid by 2030. So all we do is really towards ensuring that we give better, we're, we're more deliberate in the way we give in a, in a way that it reduces our reliance on development aid or international aid, um, and we're able to galvanize local resources to solve local problems in Africa. In, in addition to our convenings, we engage in research work, um, which we've done in partnership with some of the organizations here, but the most recent one was with Britspan. Um, and we have, um, we're engaged in various aspects of our work that is really designed to improve the philanthropic infrastructure on the continent. I think I'll stop there because we don't have a lot of time. Thank you, Akima, you can go ahead. Sure, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hakima Abbas, I use she and her pronouns, and I am the co-executive director of the Black Feminist Fund. Uh, the fund is a global fund dedicated to significantly increasing the resources for black feminists around the world. In, we work in Latin America, the Caribbean, North America and Europe, Africa and uh, the Middle East. And we not only want to significantly increase the resources through grant making, but also through advocacy and leveraging with uh, other, within philanthropy. Yeah, go ahead, Evans. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Ivan Sokini. I work with the East Africa Philanthropy Network. We are celebrating our 20 years of existence this year. And um, um, we exist to promote sustainable development um, in the East Africa region that we want to see driven by a vibrant philanthropy. And uh, for us, we want to provide a platform that champions, that connects, and that co-creates innovative solutions uh, to advance philanthropic practices in the five East African countries. Uh, we do this by generating knowledge and learning. Uh, we want to see collaborations between government, private sector, and, and uh, civil society being enhanced. Uh, we want to see a better enabling environment for philanthropy. And we also come from the background that all those three are only possible if we have stronger institutions. So we also exist to strengthen the institutional capacity of the membership um, within EAPN. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Evan says you have the mic. Um, I'll start to ask you the first question. Can you please give us insight of the, this inflation we are talking about in the field and um, the shifts uh, that are taking place? And also tell us what is the advantage then of collaborative philanthropy? Uh, thank you. 
So um, the shift that uh, we are talking about, or rather that we are seeing, I believe are being driven by around four factors, political, economical, uh, social, cultural, and most likely technological, um, amongst others, but majorly those four. And um, what we are seeing is um, uh, a lot of practices that we are now seeing within the philanthropic space. And of course, our engagement with the other development actors is, is modeling themselves around those factors that I've mentioned. And uh, what we are seeing in this uh, uh, quickening decision making, uh, enhancing um, uh, transparency, uh, increasing impact are some of the fruits that we can easily put on the table when we talk about why it is important for us to collaborate. Dr. Tenga. Thank you, Evans. Um, thank you for the. Thank you. Yeah, that is the way we appreciate each other as Africans. Thank you, Evans. So um, <clears throat> Evans is reminding us uh, that the stakes are high and um, uh, we need to be working together. And that reminds me of one of the saying um, in Kiswahili that say, kidole um, kimoja kivunji chawa, akiwi chawa. Yeah, one finger will not kill the lace. So, um, so that is one important, but again, uh, he's reminding us on the importance of um, finding our space and our role within the development sector and um, <clears throat> being very clear at what is it that we are bringing at the table because um, other um, actors like the private sector normally um, they really know what is it that they want uh, to bring on the table. And oftentimes we are not prepared um, enough to bring um, that at the table. Um, you have also heard him talking about many other things, um, including the need to, to be part of an active uh, participant in, in, in the development um, arena. So when I was listening to Evans, um, what, I, what came to my mind is the pride we always have uh, by saying, the ways that Africa give and the Africa philanthropy practices are very inclusive and collaborative. But again, we increasingly see lack of it, lack of collaboration in most of our, <laughs> our spaces and uh, in most of um, our dimensions of existence. You'll agree with me on that. So I would like to turn now to Hakima and ask her to expand a little bit more on what Evan spoke about, the same um, shifts and um, inflation point in Africa philanthropy, but with a specific um, call and examples on what is it then that Africa philanthropy must respond on. Welcome, Hakima. Thank you. Um, the inflection point. I really like the way that's framed in our program. It's, they said, dramatic, drastic, and systemic event. But even that, at the moment, feels like an understatement. Isn't that how we all feel? Like, Ibrima this morning talked about the world being on fire. And I think that, that feels more like what, what is happening. We, we are in a moment in history of deep and multiple crises. And so the question isn't really what, whether there will be change. Change is inevitable. The question is whether we're willing to push in which direction of that change. Are we going to be pushing in the direction of normalizing what is now, maybe making that feel a little better, um, you know, advancing solutions, but solutions that may be false and not transformative, uh, reinforcing some of the devastation of the earth and all of these things? Or are we willing to support those who are pushing forward life-affirming, liberatory futures, those that are planet-sustaining? Um, we know that constituency-led African social movements are creating these liberatory futures every day. And the transformation that we need is going to be led by the most oppressed, by rural women, by uh, impoverished women. Oh, am I not being loud enough? Can you hear me? Okay. 
I'll say it again. The liberated future that we're looking for will be led by the most oppressed. It will be led by rural women. It will be led by impoverished women and gender expansive people. And the question that you asked me, Stigmata, around what is the role for philanthropy? Much of philanthropy in the world that we see is more so wealth hoarding than wealth redistributing. And it reinforces the power is asymmetry, oftentimes, the power is symmetry between the North and the South, and between all of the different factors of oppression. So as African philanthropy, are there ways that we can shift out of tinkering from the edges, which really only distracts and diverts African social movements and, and makes some feel better? Um, and move to making a difference and asking ourselves, what rules can we break? In this sector that wasn't designed for African liberation, what rules can we break in, Afri in philanthropy in order to support African liberation? Um, and for that, we will need, as Evans was saying, to take risks. We're gonna need to be bold. We're gonna need to believe in the future and the change that our liberators are creating. Um, some call that trust-based philanthropy, but even more so just are we willing to be led by the most oppressed? And participatory philanthropy, again, is one of the buzzwords. That, that it means what, what kind of goals are we setting? Who sets those goals? Who's making those decisions for how that redistribution of wealth occurs. I think this morning someone talked about impact and scale and how we as philanthropy need to measure impact. But often when we talk about scale in philanthropy, we talk about scale in relation to how social movements, what they're doing is big or small rather than also talking about what is the scale of the resourcing that we're providing. We do not often provide grant sizes that can be impactful, and yet we want people to, to make the change of transformation for our liberated future on peanuts. So how can we change that in philanthropy? How can we support those who are really creating the change, not just the registered NGOs that might have an office outside, but the non-registered, the groups and the communities and the constituencies who are shifting the realities for the majority of our people. I think for that, we also need long-term core and flexible funding. I know that's something we all say, we need to do it. We need to turn that talk into the walk. Um, we need intersectional funding. But someone also this morning, I think the keynote speaker was talking about how we leverage. Because it's true, we, we're paying with a small amount of money, unfortunately still, as African philanthropists. So what we also have to do is shift philanthropy and turn it on its head. So that no longer can it be seeming that philanthropy, at least institutionalized philanthropy, is doing us a favor is somehow providing charity for Africa, but instead that we reclaim the power, that we take back that wealth, and that we put it forward to the people who will make the change. Thank you, Hakima. Thank you very much. Um, wow. So Hakima reminded us on the fact that uh, I think one area is um, it's a provocative. Are we measuring what we, the change we want to see? Uh, what uh, type of uh, measurement tools are we using? Um, are we getting there? Uh, we have increasing number of um, institutional philanthropy which provide grants. Are we providing uh, more and better grants to support long-term um, change? Because the, the change we want to see is long-term and it's very much rooted. Um, she also spoke about one thing which I think we need to remember very much. She says, the rebellion will be held by the marginalized and the vulnerable population. So what we need to do is to be able to help them to do that as Africa philanthropist. And that the shift should start 
from us and we should stop working at the edges. Now let's come at the center. Uh, we have always said we want to be part of the table. I don't know if there is a table or we need to build the table together. So I think that is what um, Akima reminded us and um, more information which you would have been able to capture. I want to continue because of the time now to um, turn now to my young sister Moson. And Moson, um, what I want again to ask is around the same, we have increasingly saying we are do we, we are focusing on more participatory approaches, more collaborations, because we need to empower communities to be able to address their own challenges and to create uh, long-term solutions. And the question which I wanted you to help us with is, how can we do that more successfully? <laughs> Thank you. Um, every time Stigmata refers to me as my young sister, most of them, I'm always excited. It's nice to be described as young. Um, yes, uh, but on the on the issue of of collaboration, um, one of the in, in preparing for this session, one of the questions that we were really posed with was around how how well are we collaborating? We say we do this so well in Africa, but do we really do this? Uh, and so I want to tackle that and then go to what we can do better. Um, without a doubt, we're a collaborative community in, in Africa. We collaborate culturally, but for some strange reason, when we begin to put systems and structures around our work and we formalize our giving, we become insular. Um, I, I don't know if um, that is a culture, you know, an, an external culture that we're adopting or we just think that it's better for us to project ourselves and put our names and logos on something, to own something, um, as opposed to being communal um, and you know, taking what we do and what we have as, as a culture in Africa and making it better, as opposed to retrogressing when it comes to, to giving. And Evans made a, a point when he talked about COVID. Um, I'm really amazed at, I'm not even sure if I should be amazed, to be honest, but it's still amazing how well we gave in the early days of, of the pandemic in 2020. Statistics actually showed that we nearly tripled our giving in 2020. We did the same during Ebola, not at that magnitude, but we collaborated as well, especially at the private sector level, which tells us that we tend to collaborate very well when there are emergencies, and then we go back. Instead of learning from what, we've, what we do well and improving or leveraging the momentum of the giving at such times so that it becomes normal to us. We just do that and then we go back and then there's another emergency and we know there's going to be another pandemic, we have been told. Um, and so we'll go back and then when there's another pandemic, we come together again and we pull resources. But we'd have moved further ahead if we're able to build on the relationships that we develop at such times of emergencies. Um, there, before I talk, give you an example of what happened with two members of our community at African Philanthropy Forum, I think it's important to talk about the collaboration in this room. Again, Evans mentioned it in his, in his presentation, and it was said at the opening, but it has to be said again. This is a collaboration of about six organizations, and we've done this for four years. And it's a testament to what can happen when we are collaborating. And we're organizations that will be perceived as competitors. But we're not. Um, where I'm from in, in Nigeria, there's a proverb in my, in my dialect that says, which means the sky is huge enough for birds to fly. You know, so we understand that as APF, APN, Trust Africa, CAPSI, Southern African Trust, um, East Africa Philanthropy Network. That's why we're doing this. And we have collaborated very well. It's been a great partnership. And we collaborate beyond this convening. We've collaborated on research efforts. We're still collaborating. So that shows that collaboration 
can and should work, and we do better when we come together. There are some people that would not be in the room if APF alone hosts an event. Same with EAPN or, or CAPSI or all the other organizations, but together we're able to do more. And, and so I just want to talk about visiting one of our members. I, I, we, Obviously, because we're a network, we visit our members to check on them and see how they're doing. And I was having a conversation with, with one of our members, and I talked about how well this other organization was doing and what they were, and what they were giving. <laughs> the first thing he said that was surprising to me, which was interesting, was, you mean they give that little? We give a lot more than that. You know, so I said first, you're not telling your story. That's why we don't know. They know how to tell their own story, and they are putting their word out there. But the key thing I took away from that was not the giving bit. You know, I'm just saying that to say that it's important to tell our stories. But there are two organizations working in the same sector, doing these are private organizations that have foundations working in the same sector, doing the same social impact work, and they have never collaborated. They didn't know they were doing the same thing. But by being a part of APF and by having that conversation with them, we were able to make the connection. And there and immediately in my presence, they got on a phone call together and they talked about what they should be doing together, which would obviously go further doing, you know, working together as opposed to them working in silos. So for me, the frustration in this space is really watching members of our network work in silos because of the, the tendency or um, the affinity for wanting to label things as your own individual work. And that it leads me to three things that uh, Mamadou spoke to today. Um, he talked about m moving from telling institutional stories to telling stories of groups of institutions. He talked about focusing on what the community needs and, and how we can meet the community's needs. And he also talked about coming together to mutualize our resources. And that is what collaboration does. And how can we achieve that? I think the first, the first thing for, and I, I'll speak for my community and then generally, you know, the, the philanthropic ecosystem. But when I say my community, really the community of philanthropists and, and funders. Um, I, I think the first thing that, that needs to happen is, is for us to come together and you know, be, part of, be part of the work that is going on in the space and understanding what is going on in the space and join networks so that we are clear on what everybody is doing and you know who you can partner with and who you can, who, who you can trust. Because what we find is even when some of these foundations or philanthropists are open to collaborating, they don't know who to partner with because they don't know who to trust. But when you belong to a network, you're part of a network that knows the people in the space, that is familiar with the organizations, understands what everybody is doing and has a helicopter view of what is happening happening in the community, they're able to guide you in the way to go and who to partner with. So for me, and I'm not um, advertising for, for APF or any one of these organizations, but just join a credible network within your own space that can help guide you and put you in touch with the relevant organizations and so that we can pull resources and pull funds. Are you saying we have 10 minutes? Okay. No, I saw her. All right. So I'll... I'll, I'll Okay, all right, I would, I would make this brief. So we, all, we continue to hear we need to give unrestricted funding, we need to give um, flexible funding, we need to, but how is it going to happen? The truth is, the foundations we have on the continent at, at the moment, they are not that big and they are not that resourced. The only way it can happen is for them to come together and put pool funds together so that we can support local organizations that are doing work in this space. So that's really important, coming together and, and pulling resources. And then trusting local organizations. A lot of funders in, 
in Africa tend to trust international organizations more than they trust local organizations. So it's important for us to begin to look inwards and identify those who are closest to the community that are doing great work that we can support. And I think the final thing I'm, I'm going to say is, is a challenge to PSOs like APF and some of um, the other organizations in, in the room that do similar work. And that is we need to find new people because those that we go to are fatigued. They are tired of being, of being asked for funds repeatedly. Everybody goes to the same people. It's the same usual suspects that we're going to for funds. And there is very limited resources. And so we need to identify new people in this space. And there, there is a lot of work that is going on. There are people that have the potential to give, but they just don't know how and they don't know who to go to. We need to find those people so that we can unlock more funding for local nonprofits as opposed to going to the same people we've always gone to. And that's why I like the fact that we're going to have a session on emerging actors tomorrow where we talk about the other actors in this space who are giving and who we should be con concentrating more effort on in terms of finding them and harnessing their resources for better giving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohsun. Um, I see Hakima wanting to add something from what you have said. And I think I would also wish really, Hakima, if you can, to touch on the role of um, movement in transformation. Just touch on. That's a big one, Stigmata. You can't throw We can only touch because of time, okay, but at least, at least, at least, at the least. role of social movements and transformation. Um, I just wanted to add to what you were saying, sis, that um, a collaboration in philanthropy is so important. And what we do with that collaboration, learning from each other, exchanging, but also how we organize ourselves to actually make that difference. As you said, we all come with the small pots of money. How can we bring that to a bigger pot of money in order for us to give? And one of the things that I was thinking as you both were speaking was how important it is also to make sure to think about who we're collaborating with, because it has to be values aligned. One of the things that we have put together as a black feminist fund is a black women in philanthropy network. And within that network, very recently, just by way of example, we noticed the difference in response between philanthropy's response globally to say the conflict in Ukraine and philanthropy's response to what happened in Sudan there's been silence, it's crickets. So as a network of black women in philanthropy, we decided to act. And together, there's many of the folks who are in the room now, Dana, Sarah, others. Um, we've been able to raise in the last month half a million in new money for Sudan, for Sudanese feminists. It's, it's not a huge amount of money, it's, but it will make some small difference. And again, what's important is for folks to see that we're acting for ourselves and for us then to push others to come in and make some of the changes that we're pushing for. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the addition. So there, again, um, this uh, discussion by Mosun and um, Hakima is reminding us, especially uh, Mosun on the the need for us to um, interrogate on our logos and egos and uh, prioritize the community needs and the needs of our constituencies, building on relationships, because I think we are chasing more of the resources um, than uh, building with the relationship we have, we have uh, and that makes um, collaboration a little bit difficult. But also, um, most only reminded us uh, on the fact that um, we are very much uh, modeled by, I think, the way development is done to an extent that um, we focus more on project-based, you know, initiative-based, and uh, we forgot the larger picture of how best we can leverage on the resources and uh, the capital we have and the social capital and assets within our communities and how that can contribute into the development. I would like to, um, I'm seeing a lot of practitioner here and I feel very sad that um, we have limited time. These moderators, um, if I'm going to rate you, I'll rate you a little bit low uh, because I see a lot of people who would share from the practice side. Uh, but uh, we cannot invite most of them, but at least two hands from the group before I come back to the panelists and ask them to tell us, each of them to tell us at least one 
lesson that they have learned, which uh, we can take away uh, with here to enhance our transformative uh, thinking into the African philanthropy. But at least two, two questions from the floor, please bear with us, or, or contributions. And the second one is here at the front. Please mention your name, um, the organization you are representing, and um, then come with your question or contribution. Ndugum um, Kasiris Banda is my name, representing the Stop the Bleeding Consortium. So my question is that, uh, starting just with a brief comment from Bob Mali, in the abundance of water, the fool is thirsty. We are talking about philanthropy, looking at high net worth individuals, uh, corporations, and when it comes to domestic resource mobilization, particularly taxation, these are the most evaders of, of, of tax. They avoid paying a fair share of taxes. So how do we reconcile one act of stealing more and bring back a little for appreciation? Thank you. Thank you. I think you have captured the question, and I think the question um, will be responded to, uh, if possible, by the panelists, but uh, anyone can respond from the floor. The, the, the second one was here. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Mwekali from a radical innovative movement called Pussy Power, Kenya. Uh, my question will be to Akima and the rest of the panel. And um, Akima, what made you, like when you used to work in Kenya, believe in social movement, invest in social movement? And how do we pass the mic of having Akima that invested in social movement? Why am I asking this? And I want maybe you and the rest to answer. Now there's so much romanticization of social movement, where I'm seeing a couple of I N N G O calling themselves social movements. I'm seeing people who used to be anti-feminists calling themselves feminists and getting the money that belongs to the feminists. Acknowledging I don't have a register for all the feminists and marking scheme for feminism. But how do we prevent this corruption, but at the same time collaborate, but not also at the same time, engineize the struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much <laughs> for the question. Um, so there are two questions that came from the floor. Are you up to responding to part of that, eh, my colleagues? And then we'll continue this conversation even beyond um, this plenary. Uh, who wants to come first? Yeah, I, I can speak to the first question, and I, I think it's an important one, and it's a conversation that has been ongoing in this space, and particularly now because of the um, the discussion around decolonization of aid, and it's been part of what is is being discussed. Is it's not just we're not just looking at having more black people in in positions of authority in nonprofits or in foundations or having locals instead of INGOs, where the important thing is also to look at practices and accountability and how money is earned. Um, so it's, um, th this, this space is not one that is particularly governed, if you know what I mean. Um, but what I can say from where I'm sitting and from um, conversations that we have had internally is that there is, there, there is a movement towards having um, what we're looking at as a philanthropy index, which would A, um, look at how philanthropy is evolving on the African continent, and at the same time come up with indices um, that would enable us hold philanthropists and foundations accountable so that we're we are celebrating, and we're starting to do that actually with these awards that we're giving, but um, more even more systemically um, celebrating organizations that exhibit best, best practices in this space um, so that we can encourage others to do better. I also know that, um, at, at least I can speak for APF, and I, I, 
I would extend myself to some of the other organizations here that a lot of due diligence is done when we are accepting members to our network. So it's not everyone that applies that, that becomes a member, and that says something, because we need to be sure that those that are joining our community have ethical, um, be, morally they stand upright in the community and they are abiding by the ethics of our own network as well. So would you end by talking about any lesson you want to share or a good practice that you want to share shortly, just have half a minute or so? I, I think it's really listening and, and building strong relationships. I think the best thing for me in this space um, over the years is building relationships and, and leveraging those relationships. It's, it unlocks more, a lot more than funding and to concentrate less on looking for funding but building strong relationships and networks. Oh, please, you can go on. Um, the brother in the back, I'm sorry, I missed your name, but uh, thank you for that question. I, I don't even think it's a question, it's a statement, which is an important one. There is no purposeful philanthropy if it's simply tax injustice. We, we can't let philanthropy be a tool, as I said, of wealth hoarding it must be a tool of wealth dis redistribution. I don't think as Africans in philanthropy that we can, that I think this tactic is more so one of infiltration in terms of institutionalized philanthropy. And if we are to infiltrate these institutions, we have to change them once we're in. We can't let business be as usual. Um, and absolutely tax justice, I would say even economic justice, we have to, um, for a liberated Africa, it can't be capitalist, in my opinion. Um, but Rachel, you were talking about the ways in which people have captured or co-opted the narratives of social movements and how that means that in many ways philanthropy responds in ways that divert money from the most oppressed and those who are organized themselves. Uh, I see that happening as well. As you said, I think there's an enduization of resistance which we need to move away from, not only because many people can't register given the legal frameworks, um, but also because as states and frameworks become more authoritarian, how we respond to that will likely be outside of those, those frameworks. So as African philanthropy, again, it's about how we can push and take risks, fund non-registered groups, fund really those who are making the transformation that, that we need on the continent. Again, there, do you want to leave us with any lesson or best practice? Or oh, that is it? I'm not sure uh, <laughs> what lessons. Uh, no, I don't have a lesson. Sorry, stigmata. OK, it's OK, it's OK. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. yeah, so uh, stigmata has told me to go straight to lessons. Um, one of the, our cultural roots as a people in this continent, uh, which have for the longest time being, be, being based on community, based on collectivism and solidarity are actually natural points of collaboration for us as a continent. And um, if you look at initiatives which have, which have withstood the test of time, are those ones which were pegged in communities those ones which had communities at the center of creation or rather co-creation all the way to what they are today. And we looked at this during COVID-19 when all the people that we have been looking at as a continent went to settle their domestic issues and we were left as a people. And we saw a continent rising up to stand, mobilize its own resources from co 
communities and deal with the challenges that we had then. And so a critical lesson come, came out of this, and we understood as a network, for example, at EAPN, that there's a lot of resources that is existing in this continent. And all that we need to do is to be uh, to approach it from a co-creation angle, to be as inclusive as possible, to have communities at the center of decision making, and then push forward uh, the development agenda. The keynote speaker in the morning gave an example of uh, uh, the, the collaborative uh, initiative that they did, Rockefeller, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. There's what Ford is doing with Mott in South Africa. There are a lot of initiatives that came out during COVID, and they have, they have proved that they can be transformative uh, if handled well. And so the lesson that me I can share from my end is the need for us to be very co-creative, the need for us to be very inclusive. And as I come to a close, Dr. Tenga, I think that a lot of times we go to conferences and have good conversations, they have good engagements, but then we fail to appreciate the role that infrastructure support organizations play in the implementation of the deliberations of these conversations. We fail to appreciate the role of having a well-coordinated ecosystem uh, for the advancement of whatever resolutions we come out with. And I will not stop uh, without challenging us uh, to really embrace the need to be part of you know, um, networks, you know, because whether we talk about uh, enabling environment, this can only be championed by a movement. Those movements are built from these networks that we are talking about. <clears throat> if we talk about our engagements with the government, we cannot do it as individual entities, but we can do it as a collective voice. And so I want to challenge us, the donors in the room, uh, the other entities in the room, this is the time for us to build a stronger ecosystem, to really build a stronger infrastructure, to champion the agenda that we are collectively championing. Thank you. <laughs> Colleagues, allow me um, to invite you to thank the speakers uh, while I'm quickly running, um, wrapping on what they have shared, and especially in the end. There, in, the, in between, I was already telling you about uh, what is it that they stressed on when they were responding to questions, but I think for me, I'm carrying um, three key messages, uh, one from each. One from Mosun, build relationship and leverage resources. Um, from Hakima, take risk and support in a long-term manner because the issues we need to deal with are very much rooted and they need long-term uh, perspective in addressing them. Evans, um, be a co-creator, be inclusive, and make sure you appreciate the role of the infrastructure that can bring us together to form relationship, to be able to leverage on resources, but also to be able to build the trust. Trust was discussed um, many times here. Um, that is, I think, is what is coming up. So to conclude, what I was hearing us saying um, in this plenary is that we want the future of African philanthropy but we want the future that is widely owned, and we want the future which is developed through values, through principles and processes of participatory and collaborative philanthropy. And to do that, we need to have the right, we need to change ourselves and have the right mindset. And we need to, be hum we need to have humility and boldness and be ready to challenge our own power and also to listen to and work with others. With this, kindly join me to thank the panelists again. 